Okay, so we're talking today about Weimar Republic, and uh, the topic really is the downfall of the Weimar Republic. So we'll try to focus on the events from the uh, high time of 1924-25, the good years, and then uh, possibly discuss the downfall of the Weimar Republic in 1933. So just to repeat the major points, uh, the initial years of Weimar Republic were pretty much turbulence, close to catastrophe, the, the putsch, the cup putsch of the right, the leftist uprising of uh, the Spartacus group in 1919, uh, the rise of veterans uh, organizations and the National Socialist Party, the hyperinflation, the French occupation of the Ruhr or Rhineland, all these were just catastrophic things that put into question whether Germany could be stabilized at all. But then it was, and uh, here is the things that we mentioned Ch uh, Chancellor Stresemann do, uh, did. So he comes to power, he puts a coalition of liberal and socialist parties. Uh, center party is the Catholic party of the Cologne area, and uh, it's a kind of a untinged by corruption or association with the right-wing forces. So it's a, it's a center-left, in today's political vocabulary, it's a center-left coalition, and they begin to do things that are quite impressive. So, number one, uh, they um, convince the French to withdraw from the Rhineland. By 1925, the French are out. How do they do that? They, they manage to convince them that Germany is going to re resume paying reparations. Uh, that, in, in turn, was possible by a very, very uh, positive, in true sense of the word, positive intervention of the United States. And this is known in history as the Doe's Plan. The Doe's Plan. Doe's was a financier. He was in the American Office of Budget. He was interested, among many others, in stabilization in Germany. Uh, the American business was convinced that Germany has to be put on track as the most important economic power in Europe. And uh, Doe's did a great contribution by creating this plan. The plan basically was a kind of what today would call renegotiation of the plan to pay out reparations. So the Germans were supposed to pay them off much longer period, over 50 year period. Uh, and the Americans were going to give a huge loan to German state in order to ease the payments of the reparations. So it's 800 million loan to Germany from the US in order to stabilize its currency and in order to uh, extend the time frame for repaying reparations, which is known as the Doe's plan. It actually worked and made miracles. Uh, it allowed the German government of Stresemann to reform the currency and to uh, dump the Reichsmark. And they basically burned all of this worthless money and started a new currency, uh, which, was, which replaced the old Reichsmark. Uh, so this, was, uh, this immediately led to stabilization of prices, to the fall of unemployment, to the rise of uh, new businesses uh, and to basic stabilization on internal situation. Now, also, uh, very, you could say, spectacular achievements of Stresemann's ministry in foreign affairs. Uh, already in 1922, this is before Stresemann, there was a Soviet-German uh, um, treaty signed, more or less secretly, but it was a recognition. Germany was the first country to recognize Soviet Russia, the first country of Western power to recognize it. And they were both outcast powers and they signed the peace treaty. But even more important, uh, there was a what is known in history as the spirit of Locarno. And Locarno is a beautiful Swiss town. And there uh, Germany signed um, a kind of a accords of understanding with Britain and France, which pretty much was the, uh, this is why it's called the spirit of Locarno. It pretty much recognized Germany as a normal uh, country that should be eligible to join uh, League of Nations. As, so as of, tw as of 1926, Germany is admitted to the League of Nations as an equal uh, member, and that is a recognition of legitimacy 
of German government and of German uh, uh, <coughs> responsibility in world affairs. Uh, so the spirit of Locarno it is usually seen in Western history as a kind of a reconciliation of sorts between Britain and France and Germany. Uh, now, the, the, the Germans were not happy with the Versailles Treaty, and they still were saying that they're not in accord, uh, you know, really happy with it. But the spirit of Locarno refers to a kind of a, a promise, not fixed in any documents, but a kind of a possibility to revise the Versailles Peace Treaty sometime down the road later. In other words, Germany was made to say, if you behave well and become a good member of Western Community of Nations, there is a possibility of revision or change in the uh, pr provisions of the Versailles Treaty. <clears throat> now, obviously, it would not concern the borders, but it could have concerned limitations on German army, limitations on research and development of aircraft and, and other things that are important for countries' stability. Now, also less known, but also equally important, is the Treaty of Berlin, which uh, was the new agreement between Soviet Russia and Germany, Weimar Germany, and that agreement had uh, also all kinds of important economic cooperation issues, which were very beneficial for Soviet Russia because Germany uh, was uh, a major industrial power with lots of know-how and new technology. Uh, and the Russians were interested, of course, very much in developing their industry. So in exchange for big German investment, and especially technology transfer, there was a secret clause in the, in the Treaty of Berlin that allowed Germans to train their pilots and to develop new aircraft on Soviet territory, which was, of course, uh, a violation of Versailles Treaty, but it is something that both the Germans and the Russians benefited from. So a lot of uh, Russians benefited, of course, by watching you know, German aircraft and the research and development crews and pilots, and, and of course, probably they, uh, you know, not just watched, but tried to learn uh, from German uh, scientists. Uh, and at the same time, it was a chance for the Germans to um, continue development uh, of um, new technology, military technology applications, uh, d despite the limitations of the Versailles Peace Treaty. Uh, now, also, what is also important in economic affairs is that the Dow's plan led to the next very important international event, which is now overlooked a lot of times in, in history, but, but it should be acknowledged as an important step. And this is called Brian Kellogg Pact. Now, Brian Kellogg are the two authors of this pact, and it became an international treaty, which today sounds naive and meaningless, but it was something that was uh, a declaration of principle. The Brian Kellogg Pact basically says that the signatory countries uh, oblige themselves not to resort to war in cases of dispute. So, so it's a kind of a, a, a treaty to restrain from use of military force. Uh, if there is a dispute, it has to be handled through the League of Nations. Now, again, it was sort of meaningless because uh, most of them did use force and they continued to use force, especially Britain and France in the colonial areas. But the colonial areas did really didn't matter. It, it, what they were talking about is the members of the League of Nations, and many of the colonial areas were not members of the League of Nations, so it only concerned sovereign states. Nevertheless, it's a kind of a nice thing to do to pledge that you're not going to use force. Uh, even more important political event, uh, I mean, the uh, significance of this is that Germany is now treated as an equal member of the League of Nations, which is sort of recognition that Germany is back. Now, in terms of economy, 1926, Germany GDP reached the level of 1913, which is remarkable. Now, don't forget, 1913, G Germany produced more steel than Britain, France, and Russia combined. So, by 1926, Germany is back as a major industrial power, uh, and it is going to continue to be that all the way to the present. 
I already mentioned that these four years, uh, basically all of 1920s, is an uh, absolutely fascinating period of German culture. Uh, particularly with Berlin becomes a cultural center, like what Paris was in Vienna and St. Petersburg before World War I. And uh, to be specific, uh, the, the extremely popular genre of the time is political cabaret. Uh, which doesn't really have its equivalent. In, in France, the cabaret is more like entertainment and dancing of girls on the stage. That's not the German cabaret. The German cabaret is political satire. It's kind of today we would call it a stand-up comedy, but only political comedy. It's going to be making fun of all kinds of politicians and events, and people are sitting around the tables kind of in a restaurant type atmosphere and there's a kind of a show goes on but it's not you know silly jokes or some magicians doing tricks it's it's political uh, satire that is being performed uh, uh, German theater of course is is one of the most innovative German cinema in architecture Bauhaus now a famous firm is experimenting with new forms in architecture which, which becomes the leader in the world uh, German science is absolutely astounding and the proof is that in 1921 uh, Einstein receives Nobel Prize and he is still in Germany and he is still producing Max Planck, uh, today there are Max Planck institutes all over Germany, which is technology uh, development uh, institutes, research facilities all over. He is uh, in Germany. Uh, German Marxism, German philosophy, Heidegger, most famous one of uh, German contemporary philosophers, uh, is teaching in, uh, in the German university. So Germany is back again as a major cultural center, scientific center, economic center, and essentially it's it's just back uh, in the center of Europe as a attracting uh, beacon of success.